The article titled, I Think We're Gonna Need a Helicopter, from NPR One is a live storytelling episode recounting a camping trip in the North Country. The author describes the challenging journey to their remote campsite, emphasizing the preparation and camaraderie among family members. The story also introduces a character named Tom, who becomes the author's best friend. Treacherous. Treacherous. Gunnel. Gunnel. Podcast. Podcast. Everything is going quite smoothly. Until one of the kids goes, Mr. Howard, Mr. Howard, look at Mr. T. And there's Tom on the edge of Lake Colby jumping up and down. And, and Tom never does jumping jacks. So this was, <laughs> this was kind of an unusual thing to see. So, and then one of the kids says, he's yelling something. So I go, shh, quiet, quiet. The word fire comes rolling across Lake Colby. <laughs> That's Jim Howard, live on stage at the Howell Grand Slam in 2018. And on today's episode, plan for the worst. From NCPR and the Adirondack Center for Writing, this is The Howell. True stories, no notes, live on stage in the North Country. I'm Ethan Shanty. I've never climbed Mount Everest, and I'm not going to, because honestly, I'm not even equipped to hike Mount Marcy. But I do know a thing or two about treacherous paths. Every year I go camping with my brothers, and we're not content to just rent a campsite with showers and bathrooms. No, because my family is my family, we've got to do it the hard way. And the hard way means traveling 13 miles of dirt road with trucks and trailers and ATVs loaded up with everything you could possibly need to survive four or five days of off the grid, no electricity, no cell service camping. Food and drinks in coolers, clothes, tents, chairs, firewood, bug spray, sunscreen, towels, utensils, a camping toilet, portable speakers. The list goes on and on and on. And when your camping party is 10 people or more, that load becomes heavy. But it doesn't end there because after you hit that 13 mile mark of dirt road, you still got another three miles to go. And that path is a surprise each year. It's an untended ATV trail with downed trees, gigantic mud holes, and long stretches where your vehicle is at a 45-degree angle. And those three miles can take over an hour because you're constantly having to stop and start, having to dig your vehicle out of the mud, and by the time you're done, you need a bath. And that's just how it starts. You've got to do it all over again at the end. But I'll be honest and say that when we go, we do go prepared. We are prepared for the worst. And it is so worth it. The view when you get there, my God, that beach, magnificent. And those few days are near close to perfect. Every year it gets harder and harder to return to reality. We've never had an accident yet. Like I said, we go prepared. But on today's episode of The Howl, Jim's long streak of incident-free camping is ruined when he decides to bring along his best friend. I'm going to tell you right off, be honest. I'm not a big fan of superlatives, like biggest, fastest, loudest, because I figure technology within a week will eclipse whatever was biggest, fastest, loudest, and a new, something new will be on the horizon. I can also be irked by the term best, as in my best friends and I are going to Las Vegas for the week. I thought best meant you had one best friend. Um, And I have a best friend. His name is Tom. Tom and I used to build houses together uh, and get in trouble together. Uh, This story is not about that Tom. I call him Tom Trouble. Uh, This story is about a man that I met while I was teaching at Peru. He he just had this infectious laughter and had the ability to make you happy when you didn't necessarily want to be happy. We'll call him Teacher Tom because Tom was his name as well. And he became my best friend as well. Now, Tom and I were really like two brothers from different mothers, as the saying goes, on two different planets. Tom was an amazing guy, but he was much different than I. Tom was very tall. You can tell I'm not. Uh, I like to wash and vacuum my car at least uh, once a week. <laughs> Tom, the inside of Tom's car looked like Casella Recycling Center. When I got ready for teaching in the morning, I had a whole closet full of neckties, and it would take me 15 minutes to pick out the tie, match the shirt, get the Windsor knot, all that kind of stuff. Tom had one tie. It was on the back of his classroom door. When he walked in in the morning, he put it over his head, and then when he left in the evening, he put it back on the door. (laughs) 
Tom, Tom did not like the wilderness. He thought two trees closer together than 100 yards was a forest. <laughs> I like the forest and camping, etc., and being outdoors, cooking, and all of that. My first year teaching at Peru, I noticed at the end of the year in June, the sixth graders were coming to school with packs and uh, sleeping bags, and come to find out, they were leaving at the end of the year to go for four days in the wilderness, and they climb Mount Marcy, and it's like, wow, I can do that. My fifth graders could do that. So the very next year, and for the next five years, we raised money, we sold everything you can sell, we got enough money, and we went, ironically enough, to the Lake Colby New York State Conservation Camp just down the road from here. Beautiful, beautiful facility. Amazing lodge, kitchen, cabins for everybody. So I do this for five years. Tom's teaching down the hall. One day he comes up to me and he goes, Jim, because that's what he called me, he said, you know, my kids, my kids are tired of hearing about how much fun your kids have every year at the end of the year. He said, I want to go with you. I go, Tom, you don't like woods. You can't cook. What would you do? Uh, put me in the kitchen. I'll do something. So, okay, Tom signs up. Now we have a lot of kids, and we have to have enough money to bring us all down here to Lake Colby. So we start a school store called the Rainbow Store, and for the first couple weeks, we sold pencils, erasers. Things went pretty well. We went to the Lavin candy shop and came out with boxes full of candy bars. And within three weeks, we're in the principal's office because uh, staring at the cafeteria manager who said she'd never seen so many people charge their lunch. They closed our store, but we had made, <laughs> immediately, we had made enough money to go. And come the end of the year, we're ready to go back down to uh, Camp Colby. It's a five-day event. The first day, we just get adjusted. The kids get in their cabins. And everybody goes to sleep. Nice. Second day, we climb Mount Algonquin. It's a long journey, 7.64 miles. As you know, one way. It's uphill both ways, unfortunately. Um, and uh, Tom says, ah, I, I can do this. I go, I don't think you can do this, Tom. <laughs> Your diet's been pizza and chicken wings for the last 20-some years. How are you going to do this? I can do this. Well, he couldn't do this. When we finally get to the top, Tom is nowhere in sight. Uh, maybe a half an hour later, he appears. He looks exhausted. He walks over to the, one of the little peaks over there, and he just falls into a bundle of bones and skin in two walking sticks. <laughs> we eat lunch, and it's time to go back down. I go over to Tom, I wake him up. He looks at me and goes, Mr. Howard, Mr. Howard, my legs, they're not working. I need a helicopter. <laughs> I go, Tom, we can't afford a helicopter. <laughs> so we turn him on his belly. Another parent and I, we rub his legs, much to, much to the odd looks from other hikers coming up along the trail. <laughs> but we get Tom back up on his feet, and he goes down slowly and comes in last again, of course. So we put him off in his cabin and say, Tom, sleep it off. You'll be fine. Tomorrow, you'll just work the kitchen. He's okay with that. Wednesday was CC day. Canoes and crafts. And the, generally, all the kids would be out in the canoe, and uh, the craft would be making sand candles. So I say, Tom, this is the only job you have. There's 75 boxes of wax. And near the stove over there, your job, melt the wax. By the time we come back in, everything will be fine. We'll, we'll have the kids make depressions in the sand, we'll put a little string in there, they'll make candles, their mom and dad will be so happy. The parents and I take the eight canoes and we head out into, onto uh, Lake Colby. Everything is going quite smoothly until one of the kids goes, Mr. Howard, Mr. Howard, look at Mr. T. We, we move our canoe around, we look over there, and there's Tom on the edge of Lake Colby jumping up and down. Jumping jacks, one arm, you know, two arms, obviously. But two arms, he's just jumping crazy. And, and Tom never does jumping jacks. So this was, <laughs> this was kind of an unusual thing to see. So, and then one of the kids says, he's yelling something. So I go, shh, quiet, quiet. We listen. The word fire comes rolling across Lake Colby into our canoe area. Oh my God, I know, there goes my retirement. And so we go, okay, boys and girls, we need to get back to shore. 
I had four kids in my, my canoe, we all had paddles, trying to get all of them organized and steer so they're going in the same direction, that is back to camp, was like watching marble spill onto a wooden floor. They were all over the place. Two kids in front of me, the pad I'm saying, come on guys, faster, faster, his paddle flies out of the water, it hits the kid sitting in front of me, right in the side of the face. <laughs> we go, okay, the paddles are in the bottom of the canoe. Now it's just me, and I'm not maybe the fastest canoeist in the world, but I try. We get closer and closer. Finally, I'm close enough. My leg goes over the gunnel. I'm in the water. I'm walking up, and Tom is still jumping jack, screaming fire. He grabs me. We have a fire. We run into the lodge, and sure enough, on the stove, there is a flame shooting out of that pot like an upside-down Saturn V booster rocket. It is reaching the top, and the ceiling is black. My life is over. A parent comes in just about the same time as Tom run over with a dish towel. I don't know what he's going to do with a dish towel. You could get hurt. So I hug Tom, bring him away. The parent and I both point to the stove, and I say, go. The parent runs over. He picks up the lid sitting next to the pot, puts it on top. Boom! The fire's out. <laughs> it was, Tom goes, oh, my God. Is that it? I go, Tom, not quite. <laughs> Two footnotes to this story. One, with ladders, lots of paper towels, and two entire bottles of Windex, we were able to wash the soot off the ceiling. 99.99% .99 in case anybody's from New York State sitting out there. It looks pretty good. The second footnote is that unfortunately, last year, about this time, Tom passed away unexpectedly. And so I'm sharing this story as a tribute to my friend Tom because he made me laugh the loudest and hardest and longest of anyone I've ever known. Thank you for listening. That's it for this episode. And remember, folks, brush up on your fire safety before you head out on that big camping trip this fall. Thanks to Jim for the story, and thanks to you for being with us. And that is officially a wrap on Season 1 of the Howl Podcast. Don't worry, though, we will be back in the new year. And in between then and Season 2, we might just have a couple of bonus episodes, but you'll have to click follow to find out for sure. Before I go and I leave you with the credits, let me just say that one of the biggest ways that we're able to do this show is with your support. I have loved so much hearing from all of you, getting your feedback, getting your emails, and now is the time for me to tell you that we rely on financial support from our fans to keep this whole thing going. So because you've been with us all season long, show your support right now by making a donation. You can head to ncpr.org give. That's ncpr.org give.